When you have to work as hard on the fields just to make a living, as the Morgan family does in Sounder, you deserve a special beverage as a treat once in a while. And even though ordering a premium coffee to your front stoop in 1930s Louisiana was just not going to happen, things have changed for the better in the 90 plus years since. And this same family doing this same job way down south in 2023 could partake of the hot stuff known as spark plug coffee just as easily as my neighbor in Toronto could, for example. What Nathan, Rebecca, and their family would get are the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in all of Canada. The Morgans would have the option of shaking up their choices once in a while because Spark Plug has different seasonal blends. The menu also features a wide variety of blends and roasts. And if you don't want caffeine in your system, they've got half-calf and decaf. Louisiana is a long way from Toronto, a 20-hour drive in fact, and that's looking at Google Maps now, never mind back before we had so many roads and highways. But Spark Plug does deliver to customers in the United States within a week. Canadians get that same in a week or less guarantee too, but my country men and women will get their product shipped for free. So be Canadian. What people in the Deep South, or the Far North, really need to know is that membership in the Autopilot Coffee Club gets you perks and deals that will make some laissez-faire orderers envious. A laissez-faire orderer. That might be the only French I put in this entire review, and it is set in Louisiana. I should have done more French. Members also save money on every single order, so they'll have extra money to use to buy ads to promote their miracle dog, who recovers from a shotgun blast, mostly by laying low and licking the wound, I guess. This dog deserves to be on the cover of magazines. Get him some promotion, man. And this autopilot coffee club is, take heed now, no constrictive coffee of the month club. You can cancel or even just pause any time. Pause. P-A-W-S. No, the other pause. And you can customize to get your orders when it suits you, not just when it suits the good folks at Sparkplug. They want to work with your schedule, not saddle you with coffee when you aren't around to drink it. Maybe you're in jail or something. And maybe there aren't a lot of computers even now on sharecropper farms down in rural Louisiana, but whoever has access to that technology should type in sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. Then make sure to use our H-Y-E-S promo code to save 20% off their very next order. And that means you. Unless the you lives in Germany or Greenland or Ghana or something. Okay, it's time to get into the main body of this podcast, so I'll ask Andrew Luther to hover his fingers over the keyboard so he can play our theme song in just a second. Ready, Andrew? An action! Have you ever seen... Sounder. Hello, friendly friendos, and thank you for downloading, streaming, or finding some other way to listen to episode number 513 of Have You Ever Seen? You could be listening to this, or while watching it, on YouTube, for that matter, too. This podcast reviews classic movies and makes no bones about spoiling those classic movies, so know that now. I'm your solo host today, Ryan Ellis. Bev is taking this week off. This might be a common occurrence for the next several months, that she'll sit out an episode once a month, especially when there's a holiday, as there is today. In fact, most of the next several months, there will be a holiday. There's one in July, and in August, and in September, in fact. Well, for that matter, October, but that's not the summer anymore. But I didn't want to leave you with nothing to listen to on our normal posting day of Monday. So here's my plot breakdown and analysis of Martin Ritt's well-regarded movie about a hard-working Southern black family and their dog, which is the perfect accompaniment for Victoria Day here in Canada. Queen Victoria, fireworks, sharecroppers. What I do during these solo lip wags is to set things up by talking about the film's critical reception, the box office, and the various accolades a movie might have received. Or did receive, I guess. Then I work my way through the plot, tossing in some asides, goofy quips, and possibly funny one-liners, possibly funny, as we go along. You might even get to enjoy or roll your eyes at some impressions. It's all part of my general tomfoolery. Also, trigger warning. I've become a bleeding heart liberal in my old age, despite my many problems with some of my fellow bleeding heart liberals, and I'm going to rag hard on people whose default attitude is either blatantly racist or just subtly so. If you look at the world that way, A, stop fucking doing that, and B, don't bother listening to this episode. I know I was shrill in some of our political episodes like Fahrenheit 9-11 and Zero Dark Thirty and some of the racial ones like 13th. Hell, it bothers me to hear that back when I've heard those episodes later, or even when I was just working on editing and so on. Never mind how it might have annoyed any of you. And while I'm going to try to keep my blood pressure in check during this one, I think this is going to be a fiery show. And by the way, I only watched the movie yesterday, in pieces in fact. I had to finish it at work because I got interrupted by Bev coming home for dinner. And then I did all the write-up and stuff late last night. So this might be a little bit more rough than usual. I hope not, but I haven't really had a couple of days to look over and fine-tune it and whatnot like I usually do. I've also only been up for about an hour and a half. So, excuses aside, let's fire it up. Martin Ritz Sounder was released by 20th Century Fox. 
going on 51 years ago on September 24th, 1972. It did very well at the box office, and the reception on Rotten Tomatoes has been pretty good over the years. There are only 21 critical reviews on that site, but 90% of those with informed opinions give this film a passing grade. Their average is 7.7 .7 out of 10, and 77% of audiences like it too. How about that? Critical average, 7.7. .7. Audiences overall percentage, 77. Many people doubted that black audiences would show up for a movie starring their own people that wasn't a black exploitation action movie, but Sounder did very well. Wikipedia says it was 10th at the U.S. box office in 1972, but the numbers has it 13th. Either way, this was a success, especially considering how little it cost to make. The Godfather was an absolute smash hit and was number one that year. The Poseidon Adventure was second, Deliverance was fourth, and Cabaret wound up seventh. All those movies have been reviewed and they're in the archives. In fact, the Poseidon Adventure was just late last year. Sounder was entered into the National Film Registry in 2021, along with Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Return of the Jedi, Strangers on a Train, and Whatever Happened, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. We've covered all five of those in the past, so again, I suggest you scroll back if you're curious what we thought of any of those films. Sounder was up for four Oscars, but didn't win any of them. Best Picture, Paul Winfield was nominated for Best Actor, Cicely Tyson had a shot at winning Best Actress, and Lon Elder III was up for his adapted screenplay. It lost three of those four awards to The Godfather. Best Picture, Best Actor, and The Script. Martin Ritt wasn't one of the five candidates for Best Director, so to quote Billy Crystal about, I think Driving Miss Daisy, he said this, this was apparently the movie that directed itself. Marlon Brando won Best Actor that year for his work in The Godfather, then of course refused to accept the Oscar. Paul Winfield was a huge underdog, not just against Brando, but the other three candidates were Michael Caine, Laurence Olivier, and Peter O'Toole. And Peter O'Toole had never won before. He was so overdue, and he never did win a competitive Oscar at all. That's a tough crowd. And it's funny to think Winfield was even nominated at all because he's not in the movie for a long stretch of time in the middle. A long stretch. Supporting actor, okay, maybe. Of course, I'm on the record as saying that's what Brando should have been up for that year himself, while Al Pacino should have been in the best actor race instead for The Godfather. I'm with you now. Winfield and Tyson, by the way, were the first two black actors up for leading awards in the same movie, and it's only happened a few times since. Angela Bassett and Lawrence Fishburne in What's Love Got to Do With It, and Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. That's it. Only three times ever. And none of those people won, although Bassett, I think, really should have. Fishburne would have been a good choice. Viola Davis, Bev and I said that when we talked about that movie in the Oscars preview that year. She's a great actress, but not in that. But still, only three times ever for two black actors in those leading roles that were up for an Oscar. Sounder was 61st on the American Film Institute's Top 100 Cheers. That was one inspiring spot ahead of Braveheart, which I covered on my own during Oscar month in March. Cicely Tyson's character, Rebecca Morgan, was a candidate for the AFI's Top 50 Good People on their Heroes and Villains list. Although I would have nominated Kevin Hooks, who plays David, over Tyson for that list, if anybody from this movie is a hero. Not really heroes, I don't think. They're just regular people. The film was amongst the 400 nominees for both the 1998 and 2007 AFI Top 100 lists. All right then, the story. But before I do all that, I gotta tell you, I watched this on Canopy, and they open things with the movie's trailer for some reason. I've never seen that before, I don't think anyway, in a streamer. It's the widescreen trailer, but it's still in the 4x3 format. I didn't realize as I was trying to fast forward the thing that the aspect ratio problem was a bad omen. That's because the movie itself is in 4x3, even though it's supposed to be a 239 to 1 aspect ratio. I was tempted to pay for it on iTunes, but I looked at the preview there and it was showing the same 4x3 thing with the trailer. So here's reason number 49 or 749, why I hate technology. And this is a Fox movie, so it should be available on Disney+. Plus. Now maybe it's the production company's fault and not the studio that owns it, but somebody's got to fix this. It's supposed to be a classic movie. It is a classic movie. Come on. I was tempted to try something else in this spot after all that, even though I've promoted it in other episodes that I'd be covering Sounder today, so I didn't want to lie to you and then change it up. So I soldiered on with the dreadfully ugly pen and scan print. But anyway... It's just a black movie, right? Who cares if it looks good or is even shown properly? There was even a bit of buzz on the soundtrack. Although I guess you could maybe argue that that's supposed to be some kind of bug making, but bugs don't make noises that constantly. No. Okay, I set up a soldier. Let's soldier. So Nathan, who's played by Paul Winfield, is hunting late at night in Louisiana in 1933. He's trying to put holes in a raccoon. Would he not make the thing inedible if he managed to hit such a small animal with a shotgun? But hey, there's the title character giving chase. Good old Sounder gets closer to capturing their dinner than any human does. Nathan gets mad for a minute that he dropped the ball by not dropping the raccoon, then apologizes to his son David for losing his cool. He's also still a bit pissed that he didn't nail the trash panda with that first shot. He's no Alvin York. 
The Morgans head home and Nathan rhapsodizes about how good a dog Sounder is. Strange name for a dog, Sounder. These friendly people really love their dog. His wife, Rebecca, who of course is Cicely Tyson, doesn't seem surprised that her man failed to bring home the bacon late at night. The bacon? Raccoon? Bacon? <laughs> but I'm not implying there's tension here. These two are still in love, despite having to raise three kids on tiny wages. They're not jaded old people. Or older, I guess. Not old at all, actually. Day breaks and the kids wake up to find meat cooking on the stove. How did that happen? Look at these privileged black people expecting to <laughs> eat food. America, you give them too much. We must stop this food giving or food eating. But where did that meat come from? Well, that trailer I didn't want to watch off the top of the canopy print told us Nathan ends up in jail. So I'm guessing he stole it. And of course he did. I haven't seen this film in so long that I really didn't remember. David hustles off to school and spends some time learning. And after school, he takes the laundry Rebecca did over to Mrs. Boatwright. The white lady pays a compliment to the talents of the black lady, but tosses a casual slur about Chinese people by saying a Chinaman couldn't do the sheets nearly as well. I guess considering Jack Nicholson tells a joke about a Chinaman in Chinatown two years later, no one thought of that as a dig, and of course they didn't back 50 years ago. Let's go for the correct nomenclature, dude. Asian American, please. David and his siblings show up to catch the very end of his daddy's baseball game, which Pops wins by craftily picking off a base runner, then striking out a guy for the last out. I love the period accurate glove Winfield wears here. It's about as thick as a sock. If somebody hit a line drive back at him, it looks like it would really hurt his hand. Anyway, they all head home triumphantly afterwards to the sounds of a guitar player named Ike strumming and singing about baseball. This guy is played by Taj Mahal, spelled like you think it is, the man who's also responsible for the music score. This is a happy group, happy family. If you didn't like them already, I'd say you have to now. They just played baseball, or at least the dad did. You gotta love them. But... Good feelings gone, when they get back home and find a flock of stern-looking white men waiting for them outside. Hey, it's Sheriff Roscoe B. Goldrain. In this, James Best isn't Boss Hogg's lackey. He's Sheriff Young, and he seems pretty competent, unlike his Dukes of Hazard character. Flash, Cletus, them Duke boys. The sheriff takes Nathan away in a truck because of that meat malfeasance, but Sounder won't stand for it. He runs after the truck in a barking fit. Despite Nathan's attempt to kick the shotgun away... One of the sheriff's men hits Sounder. Well, mostly clips him, but still, he gets a piece of him. Poor dog. I'm so glad Beb wasn't watching this movie with me. It's been more than 20 years since I've seen this flick, and I didn't remember anything about the dog. The title character getting shot, especially 30 minutes in. But he's not dead. He runs off yelping in pain with David giving chase. David can't find his beloved pooch. So I have faith our mix of Redbone Coonhound and Bulldog is going to make it. I thought maybe he was a basset down, by the way, which I think is what Sheriff Roscoe B. Goldtrain's dog is in. The Dukes of Hazard. Flash. Maybe this is a good place for my nutshell. So, Sounder in a nutshell. So Hollywood finally puts some money into a black movie, but they name it after the dog. Rebecca makes the trek to town to see her husband, although Sheriff Young won't let her lock eyes on Nathan. After all, it's not Sunday or a holiday, and she should have magically known those rules. It feels like this is a but you're black rule, rather than just a strict one everyone has to obey. Rick frames a nice shot here when Rebecca looks hopelessly at the cop, but behind her is a poster that says loyalty with a bunch of writing underneath. You can't read the writing, but you can definitely read loyalty. I find it striking because this tough woman is loyal to her husband, loyal to her family, and she'd probably be loyal to her stupid fucking country, except she dared to be born with the wrong colored skin. She also gets wet fur from the local grocer who owns the land they live on. He's pissed because how are they going to share crop for him with Nathan in jail? Nathan gets a one-year sentence to do hard labor from a tough judge. But isn't he a first-time offender? Oh, right, that skin. Damn skin. It had to go being all black and stuff. I don't agree with people who seem to think food should be entirely free. They say that now so much anyway. But someone stealing one ham shouldn't be sent up for 365 days. His family will really struggle to eat now. And guess what one of them might do? Steal! They don't, but they certainly are pushed to consider it. But of course, the skin thing. David is allowed to bring a cake his mama baked to Nathan before dad is shipped off to a work camp. I guess the He-Man Woman Haters Club couldn't fathom the idea of letting his wife bring her dessert to her man. Nathan is happy to see his oldest, and they share a bit of the cake. But hey, they had a whole three minutes together, and time's up. Come on, boy. The Morgan men shake hands, which will be the last time for quite a while. Rit efficiently dissolves to a shot of the whole family working the field right after this. Maybe they did this work together before Pops was put behind bars, but they really have to now that the patriarch is in the clink. David reads the three musketeers to his siblings in a brief scene, and I only mention it because I just happened to finally see the man in the Iron Mask, that first movie that Leo DiCaprio made after Titanic, a day or two before watching this movie. 
Canopy did have the proper aspect ratio for that film, white people. So it's a one for all and all for one kind of thing in my movie life lately, because Sounder is all about that too. What do you know? Sounder turns up. David gives the bullet surviving dog a rag bath and nurses the tough little guy through the night. And hey, he seems like he's doing okay the next morning. He wolfs down his breakfast, which is always a good sign. We'll know that our dog Sam is at the end of the line when he stops eating, because that dog loves to eat. David delivers the laundry to Mrs. Boatwright and asks if she'll find out for him where Nathan was sent. After some wishy-washiness, she vows to get the information for him. If this isn't the first smile that Kevin Hooks gets to show in the movie, then I'd be surprised. And by the way, this kid's very good in this movie. We really like Kevin Hooks' performance. And this is a sacrifice for Mrs. Boatwright. White people laying nearly anything on the line for black people back in these days was a big gamble. It probably still is now. It's one thing to be ostracized for doing it, but you might even get roughed up yourself, or worse than roughed up. But the sheriff refuses to tell her where Nathan went, which is, of course, cruel, but also pointless. If you just told her, she'd leave and you could go about your day, Roscoe. Are the white powers that be just worried that if his family knows where Nathan is, they'll try to help break him out? Yeah, that's likely going to happen, isn't it? Of course, what do we hear the last couple years of, well, all the years of Trump's presidency? The cruelty is the point. Mrs. Boatwright takes the opportunity to look through Young's files when he leaves the room, which David sees her doing. The sheriff comes in and sees her too, then dresses down his supposed friend. Notice that she goes from being Rita to being Mrs. Boatwright. Yep, so black people barely count in the eyes of the law, but women aren't much better if they don't completely toe the line. David gets mad at her for not telling him what she saw, namely where Nathan is. Well, this kid doesn't get that mad, but a little mad. I thought maybe she was going to say something sly about where he is right then, but Rit saves that for when Rita shows up to the Morgan's house and tells all of them where their paterfamilias is. I think what's going on here is, look, kid, I did see where he is, but I'm not going to tell you out in the open here. Right outside the police station, I'm going to save her for when we're in private. In fact, the next scene has Mrs. Boatwright showing the Morgans a map to where the labor camp is. I know we talk so much now about allyship and how an act like this would be considered the bare minimum these days, but this is allyship. She's doing more than she has to, and it might really cost her something, especially in 1933. If anyone watching this movie isn't touched by how committed the white lady is now, then you're not being realistic, and you're certainly not being fair. This isn't Driving Miss Daisy, where the old white racist finally sees that her black chauffeur is a human being at the end of the movie, and decades of knowing him. You're my best friend, Hoke. <laughs> Fuck you. David has a sweet fantasy of his dad and his dog happily frolicking in the field at home, but he turns to run from his dad playfully, and they're gone. I like that moment. It's simple, but very effective. The real love story in this film, in fact, is between a man and his son. David sets off with Sounder for Wishbone, the prison camp where Nathan is doing his hard time. Rit composes a shot that reminds me of the ending of The Fablemans. Probably the best part of that whole film, by the way. And it's been out for long enough now. This is a pseudo-spoiler, I guess. I'm not really sure it's a spoiler. But John Ford is in the movie, and he lectures the Spielberg stand-in, the main character, that a shot is only interesting if the horizon line is low in the frame or high in the frame. Which I don't think is true, but okay, that's John Ford's opinion. I heard that's based on a real story, too. Well, in one of the wide shots of this movie, David and Sounder are at the very bottom of the frame. And I'm talking just a tiny bit of ground, them walking, and then the rest. Above them, only sky. David and his dog make it to Wishbone, but naturally, he has to come back on visiting day, which is Sunday. They might say the same thing to a white person who's come a long way to see a family member, but rules are made to be broken, even for a black person, and this is a fucking kid. Let him see his father for two minutes. Oh, wait, I keep forgetting about that pesky skin color. Some asshole even smacks David's hand with a crowbar, which probably should have broken it. It is cut. You know, there might come a time when black people really do rise up, and if they start kicking a lot of ass, people who look like me will certainly deserve to have our asses kicked. You racist shitheads are ruining for the rest of us who just want everyone to live and let live. I'm not saying you have to make a black person your best friend in the world. Just leave them alone. Anyway, David ends up at a nearby schoolhouse, and the kindly school teacher, Camille Johnson, patches up the boy's wounded hand. She takes him in and reads important passages in books written by black people. This is a perfect example of lecturing to the audience of the film under the guise of a character doing that for the sake of another character. And I'm not criticizing it. That's just clearly what Ritt's doing. You might not have heard anything written by W.E.B. Du Bois any more than David, but after this scene, now you have. The other kids in the schoolhouse aren't particularly good actors, actually. When they read their lines during a scene set in the classroom, they feel like they're, well, reading their lines, not saying them as if it's just the character speaking. They look and feel authentic otherwise, though. They're not movie stars who've been preparing for this role for two months. They're just young black people doing their best in front of a movie camera. And when you click on Girl 1 and Boy 2 in the credits, you see that these are the only acting credits for a lot of the actors in this picture, so they really were authentic. Rit and company must have cast from people in Louisiana. 
people who probably never dreamed they'd be in an Oscar-nominated movie, and then later on, AFI lists and National Film Registry and box office success. David likes it here so much that he asks Mrs. Johnson, not Mrs., Miss Johnson, if he can return and learn at her school once his father gets back home. And speaking of home, Davy Boy gets a hero's welcome from his mother and his brother and his sister. I didn't say who they are yet. I think it's Eric Hooks playing Earl. I guess that must be Kevin Hooks' brother. I told you, I didn't do full research on this like I normally do. And then there's Josie May. Yvonne Jarrell plays her, so that must be, or maybe it's Harriet. That's Sylvia Kumba Williams. David writes a letter to Miss Johnson, just saying basic niceties, including that his family likes her just as much as he does, even though they haven't even met her. And then, he was there. Yep, Nathan returns and Sounder sees him first. The faithful dog finally finds his voice. He hadn't barked since he was shot, but it looks like Pops being back on the scene fixed him. One of the last things that Nathan heard when they took him away was Sounder barking right before he got shot, and now it's the first thing Nathan hears when he gets back. The family races to him, although he's not able to race back because he's using a crutch and limping pretty badly. This man saw some shit while he was away. He tells them that he got hurt when dynamite went off near him, and once it was obvious he wasn't going to be able to pull his weight anymore, they sent him home. Now that I think about it, is it possible? No, he couldn't have escaped with this kind of limp, and I don't think he's faking this limp for his family. Why would he? No, he didn't escape. He couldn't have escaped. Plus, they would have found him, and they would have killed him. Unlike in Tokyo's story, which we covered two weeks ago, there are hugs all around. It's an emotional scene. Very sweet stuff. It gets laid on a little thick, but the family loyalty is a special part of this movie, as we said before. Or as I said before. We oui, Kimosabe? David says the only thing he wants is for Daddy to be home. Nothing else. He doesn't even ask for a bike. I thought all kids wanted a bike. Of course, those kids don't have to live the hard life these salt-of-the-earth types do. Plus, they don't really have a good road. Still, somebody get that kid a bike. Or some books. Actually, I think he wants those more than he ever wants a two-wheeler. Nathan still has a libido for his lovely wife, which is pretty sweet to see, but otherwise he's not the same man physically. Pops Morgan tells David he's never going back to jail. They'd have to kill him before he'd go back there. Although you have to figure the racist fucks in this area are going to look for an excuse to put the man in jail again, make him a two-time loser. So he better not be willing to live up to that no-jail-or-die stance. His family needs him, whether he's got a vicious limp or not. Ike is back again, this time bringing David a letter from Miss Johnson. Camille asks David to be at her school that September. But David doesn't want to go now, both because he wants to be with his daddy, but also because the kid knows he's needed on the farm now that Nathan's leg is so fucked up. The two of them debate the school issue for a minute, but Nathan gets a little rough when David keeps saying he's not going anywhere. Father wants best for son, but I think he also resents being told he needs help, especially by a kid. David R-U-N-N-O-F-T's to the river, but Nathan eventually tracks him down and tells his kid some more details about how he got hurt. He's going to beat the trouble in his leg, which will, let's face it, take a miracle of willpower. Nathan wonders if they can get back to being friends, to which David offers a handshake, and then a hug. Sweet scene again. This is what I think Tokyo Story was missing a couple weeks ago. At least one scene where people show some affection. Even in a cold family, there's got to be somebody who's willing to touch somebody else. Nathan's vow to keep at least one of his kids from having to be a sharecropper like him just might be fulfilled at the end of the movie, because Dad is taking a suit and tie wearing David to Camille's school on a horse-drawn trailer. They and Sounder won't have to walk this time. They're going in style. And this flick closes up shop with a previous scene of father and son, arm in arm, dad bragging about how good a baseball player he is and could have made it in the big leagues if he really wanted to. Fourteen more years, sir, and you would have had a shot. I guess at this point in the story, it might be 1934, actually, so thirteen more years. Jackie Robinson is coming. So the cast. We've covered Paul Winfield, I think, only once before. That was in Star Trek II, The Wrath of God! God. But we haven't tackled the original Terminator, even though it's arguably even more brilliant than T2. The sequel was reviewed on this channel, though, so look for that back in, I think, 2016? In that first Terminator, Terminator, Winfield was the helpful cop who takes care of Sarah Connor for a while, but then gets gunned down by Arnold in the police station. Cicely Tyson, who was considerably older than Paul Winfield, a little bit surprising, usually it's the other way around, lived to 96 and died just a few years ago. Like the man playing her husband, she spent a lot of her time on TV screens. She was nominated for a whack of Emmys and even won one back in the 90s. She also took home an honorary Oscar in 2019. One of her biggest movie successes was The Help. Should have had more big movies, especially after she did this and gets the nomination for it. This was Kevin Hooks' debut as an actor. He hasn't acted in over 20 years, though. He's directed a lot more movies than he's appeared in. Like the people who play his parents in Sounder, Hooks has worked far more often on TV, including directing a few early season episodes of Lost. James Best was, of course, Chef Roscoe P. Coltrane on The Dukes of Hazard. He also acted in quite a few movie westerns dating back to the 50s. 
and Quentin Tarantino went to his acting school, although reportedly Best didn't actually teach QT how to act. It's just his acting school, but I don't think he was ever there. Damn, I wanted to blame somebody for Quentin Tarantino's acting style. Janet McLaughlin has the small but critical role of Camille Johnson. She acted for nearly 40 years, mostly working on TV, but also doing the Clint Eastwood picture Tightrope. And Swampy plays Sounder. This was Swampy's only movie. Martin Ritt, of course, directed this picture, and he also worked with Paul Newman a few thousand times, including on Hood, Hood, in 1963. He was nominated for that, which was the only time he was ever up for an Oscar. I love that movie enough to say I think he should have won over Tony Richardson for Tom Jones. I don't recall that being a great year for the movies, but definitely I love Hud, and it's one of the best movies, certainly of that year and maybe of the entire 60s. Ritt directed The Great White Hope just a few years before he did Sounder, which got another black actor, James Earl Jones, an Oscar nomination too. Ritt was a very socially conscious director. He covered the controversy of the blacklist in the front. He made a movie about Sally Field's struggle to institute a union where she works in Norma Ray, and then he did these lauded films about the black struggle. He's in league with Norman Jewison and Stanley Kramer as guys who gave black actors a chance to do real work and to be recognized for what they accomplished with Oscar nominations. These kinds of actors were finally getting to do things far away from the yes, uh, oh, miss whatever, you be the living hand. That kind of stupid bullshit. I said it in one of my recent, I think, solo reviews, where as bad as it was that anyone ever did blackface, I think in some ways it's even worse than they had to black people, actual black actors, sounding like that. Like a stupid ass kiss. Lon Elder III adapted William H. Armstrong's 1969 novel into the screenplay. He was the first black person to be nominated for a writing Oscar. Oh, but he shared that distinction this very same year because Suzanne DePasse was up for the original screenplay Oscar for Lady Sings the Blues. There haven't been a ton of black people nominated for writing since then, but four movies have taken home an Academy Award just since 2009 alone, plus Jordan Peele won in the original category, so it is getting better. Elder wrote Sounder Part 2, but only a few other movie scripts. Sounder Part 2 came out in 1976, although almost nobody from this cast was in that one, although Taj Mahal does play Ike again. John Alonzo was the Sounder cinematographer. He went on to do Chinatown for Roman Polanski a few years later. Alonzo was also the cinematographer for Harold and Maude and the Bad News Bears, both of which I've covered between my two podcasts, the other, of course, being Scoring at the Movies. And perhaps the most famous thing Alonzo ever did, if it wasn't Chinatown, was Brian De Palma's Scarface. I thought about covering that in June, but I'm thinking of shifting to the 1932 version instead. I feel like the De Palma one's been talked to death, not so much the original. So parting thoughts. Well, this is quite simply a lovely movie. I didn't remember very many details from the time I saw it before, but I was touched by the characters many times, and I like how Rit didn't get too maudlin. He didn't beatify these black people, he just let them be people. Considering this was up against the Godfather, Cabaret, and Deliverance, for this to make it to even the Best Picture shortlist was a real accomplishment. I'm sure everyone was proud of what they made here, and they most definitely should have been. Good movie. I just wish I could have seen it on a print that wasn't awful and pan and scan. Canopy and iTunes, get on that. Or whoever owns the rights to the movie is who I guess I should be ragging on. Fix it. This movie is worth it, and it should be on Disney Plus, too, for that matter. So the next time you'll hear me doing one of these yippy yaps on my own will be in 11 days when I cover Stalag 17 on Friday, June 2nd. All right, Addies, Addies, Addies. I love me some Billy Wilder, and I also love me some Bill Holden. So let's go to the Nazi prison camp and watch the flick that inspired Hogan's Heroes. Bev will be back on the mic next Monday. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse will be coming out that Friday. So we're going back five years to take a fond look at the Oscar-winning and highly entertaining Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. This podcast will be on YouTube sometime on Monday, probably before you Eastern Time Zone people wake up for the day. We've been posting each of our 2023 episodes on our YouTube channel, which is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. We haven't done this in quite some time, but some episodes have 8 or 10 minutes of Bev and I appearing on camera, giving you some extra thoughts about the movie in question, plus making recommendations of other stuff we've seen lately. We even get into listener feedback sometimes, and we plan to do all that again at some point, maybe in the summer when I won't be doing two different podcasts anymore, because Scoring at the Movies is saying goodbye on June 7th. You can follow us on Twitter. I'm at MovieFiend51, and Bev is at Bev Ellis. Ellis. Our email address is HaveYouEverSeenPodcast at gmail.com. Please subscribe, like, favorite, share, and spread the word by telling your movie chums about us. And don't forget about our coffee sponsor. Go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S to get 20% off some stupendous Arabica beans. So that was Sounder. See you back here next Monday with our Spider-Verse review. Meantime, I'm going to go pet our dogs and tell them they're good boys and girls, even though those two dopes are not nearly tough enough to survive a gunshot wound. They are not miracle dogs. And cut.